Um, we can't let these instances go um, unnoticed. So what I'm asking people to do is if you have the time, um, we would like to connect at least like one advocate with one prisoner and for people to do individual advocacy on behalf of these people, especially about the medical conditions. We can't let these people die um, because they're not, because the state's not willing to do a test to see whether or not this person needs um, a surgery or this person has different health complications that need to be addressed. So it, I don't imagine it taking a lot of time. I don't imagine people having to file lawsuits. It would really just be getting a medical release from the person um, and then following up with calls and um, emails to the, either the warden or the, um, the health department in the prison um, just to make sure that their medical issues are being addressed. We found that individual advocacy like this often re re results in people getting the medical attention that they need if, if the prison knows that somebody's calling constantly and making sure that um, that these people are not forgotten. Um, so I'm going to put a sheet in the back so if you're interested you can sign up. I don't imagine this taking more than a half hour a week. Um, and then if you're interested in doing it for more than one prisoner that would be even better. There's 30,000 people that participated so there's definitely a need um, for advocates. It doesn't even have to be an attorney. If you're just someone that can pick up the phone and make a phone call, this is something that you can do. And we're also going to have people that are very involved in the movement that could um, give you guidance if you need like information on who to contact, the best people to contact, strategies on how to do advocacy, these types of things. So I encourage you guys to sign up and, and help with that, or at the very least, just stay informed, stay involved with what's happening. Um, and another thing you could do is to encourage the State Department to grant Juan Mendez's request to come inspect the prisons. Um, that's something that they've been very slow on. Brett has asked me to do the honors of uh, introducing my comrade, uh, Edwin Cortez, a member of the FALN and represented uh, people of Puerto Rico gallantly, stood firm. I had the, the honor and pleasure of um, doing a good couple of years with this brother, uh, sharing my meals with him. He owes me commissary money. So, and, um, no, but just really, um, this is the thing in prison, a lot of times, um, in the midst of all this repression, I was just telling uh, Clarissa, you know, with her dad, it's just the honor of being there to be able to share the joys, the low points, the high points. And so um, with that honor and distinction, I would like to bring you Brother Edwin Cortez. Thank you, Jihad. Uh, it's an honor to be here with Jihad. We spent a decade together in prison in Lewisburg Penitentiary. And he owes me commissary. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, it's an honor for the National Lawyers Guild to be here in Puerto Rico. We're a little bit ashamed that you're not in a free Puerto Rico. But uh, we're, we're still working on it. 115 years of, of U.S. colonialism has not moved the North American people to abolish colonialism. Actually, it's a really a, a sad and thing to say that the United States government to this day maintains Puerto Rico as a colony for 115 years and has continued this domination and the movement against this is you know, we don't know when this is going to come to an end. I think we need another anti-war movement. I think that the people in New York had gotten it right when the 99% are dominated by 1%, but that movement against Wall Street has not been able to take hold in the United States. We've had, I'm not sure why, but that's clearly the message is that 99 that 1% of the population in the United States of America dominates 99% of the population, and I think that that has to be changed. 
and hopefully that will come soon. But we installed President Obama and the United States put Obama in power for it's going to come to eight years and the six years have gone by and he has done nothing and we can see that they utilize an African person to continue to perpetuate racism, colonialism, and imperialism. And who are these advisors of President Obama? I think that the case before the National Lawyers Guild, I know y'all been fighting for 76 years, I have no doubt about that, and the People's Law Office defended us for the last 33 years that Oscar has been incarcerated and defended the nationalists when they were incarcerated. We were moved by the experience of the nationalists and we received them in Chicago on September 10, 1979. And it was Michael Deutsch in 1972 who informed us about the case of Rafael Cancel Miranda in Marion Penitentiary and the control unit in Marion. And we came involved at that time. I was a university student and I got involved in that campaign. And I didn't do a lot of studying in the university because I was continuously involved in the campaign for the freedom of the five nationalists. And while in the university, I came in contact with the Palestinians. The Palestinians have over 10,000 political prisoners. And the Palestinians are living in a state of colonialism. And we have not been active in that case either to make that known. And I think that a, a lot remains to be done. When we received the Nationalists in September 10, 1979, it was only like seven or eight months later, and 1980, April 4, 1980, 10 Puerto Ricans became imprisoned, and that took another struggle for 20, that struggle took, has taken us 30 years. Well, the struggle for the Nationalists took 30 years because Oscar Collazo was incarcerated for 29 years. And the, uh, the struggle for our freedom has now entered its 33, 33rd year because Oscar has already completed 32. He's entering his 33. He's already almost halfway through his 33rd year. And so this campaign has taken over 60 years, a campaign that we've had for political prisoners. And that's not in every decade that the United States has dominated Puerto Rico, people have gone to prison, except for the 1920s was the only decade that Puerto Ricans were not in prison. Every decade, and that's documented by Che Paraletici in the book that he wrote, in every single decade, Puerto Ricans have gone to prison. So as a new generation of upcoming lawyers, you have very a lot of challenges before you, and I hope that you would take these challenges, and I hope that in the future that we can free our, North, our African brothers who've gone over 40 years of imprisonment. I mean, that's just, that becomes a human rights problem, and who exposes this human rights problem, and what force can we count on to bring these brothers home, and Oscar, Leonard Peltier, and to release all the 10,000 political prisoners in Palestine. All of them should come home. Why do we spend over $50,000, and in Puerto Rico we had the same case, and Puerto Rico is like 30,000, the United States is over 50, it might be more. For one per person to go to prison a year, we are spending an outrageous amount of money and we can tell you, Jihad can tell you, I can tell you, there is no education in the prison. You have to self-educate yourself. There's not even no educational programs inside the prison. And I'm glad that we got out in 1999, but I'm not glad that Oscar is still there, and I'm not glad that our other comrades are still there, but they started taking the weights from all the federal prisons in the United States. They took the weightlifting equipment because they said that the prisoners were getting too strong. And so by prisoners being too strong, that means that the guards were getting weak then. And they started removing, they actually removed all of them. Right, Jihad, all of them are gone, except Lewisburg was one of the only ones
that remained with weights. But the majority now, you have to do push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups, and you'll still be strong. So <laughs> that did not work. Because uh, 24 hours a day, Puerto Re uh, prisoners are conspiring 24 hours a day to see what can be done with their health, and not only with their health, but how they can get out of those prisons. Because in our case, this is a historic occasion because October 26, 1974 was the founding of the FALN and this is going to be our 39th anniversary and we are proud that you are here to celebrate this anniversary with us and we are proud that Jan Sussler will be recognized tomorrow on October 26th and I'd like to give Jan another hand of applause. Dennis Cunningham around there? Yeah. Yeah. That was my lawyer. <laughs> and Michael Deutsch? Not around, okay. All right. But uh, I'd like to thank you all for being here and uh, we hope that in the near future you can come celebrate this convention in a free and independent Puerto Rico and I hope that you help us make this happen. Thank you so much, Edwin. We're going to open it up for Q&A in one moment, but I feel I would be remiss if I didn't give some more background on the case of Russell Maroon Schultz, who, as I said, was one of the first people I began visiting back in 2007, 2008, when I was going into prisons in Pennsylvania. Maroon was not always known as Maroon. When he was incarcerated in 1971 for his alleged role in the homicide of a police officer in Philadelphia, he was just known as Russell Schultz. But, you know, as Edwin just said, prisoners are conspiring 24 hours a day to think about how they can better their situations and get out of those prisons, and Maroon was an exceptional example of that. In 1977, he liberated himself from the State Correctional Institution at Huntington and spent 27 days in the surrounding forest before being captured. In 1980, he liberated himself, um, of course with the help of others, from uh, another prison in Pennsylvania, and he was free for three days. When he returned to prison after that, he was told by a fellow prisoner that they were chasing you like a maroon. maroon at that point, uh, Russell did not really understand the historical illusion that was being made, so he began to do a lot of research on his own. And he found out that maroon was a term that was given to fugitive slaves, and not just to fugitive slaves, but to whole communities that were made up of fugitive slaves, of indigenous people, and even of some Europeans who were living outside of and in opposition to the slaveholding societies that were taking root with colonialism throughout the Americas. After his second escape from prison, Maroon was placed back in solitary confinement, but he was placed into the general population in 1982 at the prison in Pittsburgh. At this point, he realized that while he was successful at getting out of prison, he was having less success at staying out of prison, and he was changing strategies. He decided to have a strategic change. He was going to build with prisoners, specifically with lifers, with their family members and supporters on the outside, and seek to build a political movement that would abolish life without parole. The Lifers Association at the State Correctional Institution of Pittsburgh at that point had about five or six members that would show up at meetings, they would organize a concession and raise some money and do things like paint the cafeteria at the prison. This was before Maroon became involved. After he became involved, participation shot up to over 100 people attending meetings. Their goals were explicitly political and they had to do with agitating for their own interests to try to get themselves out of this death sentence that had been imposed on them, that they were going to die in prison. On the evening that the old leadership of the Lifers Association was impeached and Maroon was named interim president, he was thrown in solitary confinement. This was in the spring of 1983. He has not been released into the general population of a Pennsylvania prison since that time. He did 
spent 18 months in general population in Leavenworth in 1989 to 1991 when he was temporarily in the federal system. Since his return to Pennsylvania, he has been in solitary confinement until this very moment. He has not had, he has had one misconduct in the last 23 years. This was for covering a vent in his cell that was blowing cold air on him, which is a daily reality for prisoners in the hole at SCI Green when they keep the temperature artificially low 365 days a year. He's turned 70 years old in August. There's a campaign that is built in support of Maroon, including a legal effort that filed a lawsuit in May, um, like the California case on Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment grounds, and due process grounds. That's moving at its typical slow pace through the courts. We have also petitioned United Nations Special Rapporteur Juan Mendez, who made a preliminary inquiry into Maroon's case last year and reported to the UN Human Rights Council that his rights under the Convention Against Torture are likely being violated. And we are also seeking to have Juan Mendez come visit him in Pennsylvania. At the end of March, he was transferred to a new prison and uh, they began telling him that they were going to be preparing to release him into general population. After months of um, lip service, they actually then transferred him down the road to yet another prison where he has entered what they're referring to as a step-down program and where they have this 70-year-old man who has been tortured for decades cleaning in the restricted housing unit for one hour a day doing sweeping or cleaning the showers in order to demonstrate that he is capable of being out of his cell. Um, right now there are projections that he might be released before the new year, but if one thing the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections has demonstrated is that they cannot be trusted and statements about their benevolent intentions are not to be taken at face value, so we are gonna be keeping the pressure on and people can come and talk to me afterwards to learn how to be involved and stay plugged in on that. Or to uh, you know review a copy and uh, purchase one, if you would like, of Maroon's first collection of essays, which is a very powerful and unique contribution. This was published in March. So I'm going to stop right there and open it up to q and I'm not sure how much time we have left, but um, if there are comments or questions that people would like. Bob? Yeah, hi. Um, thank you to all the panelists. Um, and I know having done this kind of work for a long time, uh, doing prison work can be very, can be very frustrating. Because uh, you're not only dealing with the cases of the, of the prisoners, you're dealing with their day-to-day -day issues. And, you know, particularly Azida, I wanted to, you know, to thank you for raising some of the issues, you know, be they be medical or in that, you know, that, that come up all the time and that the individual advocacy is so important. Because it comes, you know, people are denied their mail, their communications. Sometimes the lawyers are the only people who can visit the prisoners. And so you have to provide that outlet to the world. Um, you know, I didn't like with that. I'd like to hear from really anybody on the panel. Um, there are many people in this room who, I mean, some of the, a lot of the prisoners have been in prison, and even somebody like Maroon Schultz has been in solitary longer than many people in this room have been alive. Um, why is it important for us to do this work? Why should younger lawyers, law students, etc., and I think hearing from the family would be, well, Clarissa would be great too, why should we get involved in this work? Why is it important? Um, and how can we support each other in doing it? Thank you, um, Bob. One, one reason, and just to be brief, is um, because to show support to prisoners and political prisoners, it, it, it says, first of all, just the humanity of it all. There's just the base humanity of it all. One human being assisting another that's being doled out a grave injustice. The second is that it, it, it builds up a, 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 a culture of resistance you know, to prevent these type of things from happening in the future, and, and, and for sure, they will happen in the future, and they're happening, seem to be more pervasive than ever now. I mean, more people, but the police state has definitely increased and expanded under uh, Obama, and we can know the sky is the limit, so by actually reaching back and, and helping the political prisoners, assisting the, the prisoners that are there, speaking toward these injustice, doing our role, everybody, we develop a culture of resistance because if people in this country do not do this, then 
They're already into a totalitarian state in so many ways. And I think one of the um, boasted um, uh, father, uh, fathers of this country, as they say, has said um, that those that, that would um, sacrifice their freedom for security deserve neither. the humanity. If you ask the guys at Pelican Bay why you should be involved, they would say they want to be validated as human beings. And in doing that and recognizing their humanity, we're also recognizing and affirming our own humanity. Um, and another thing that's that's a little bit different and that, that reaches out to the broader public is that, in, especially in California, in 2009, the state changed their policies regarding gang validation. So now they can not only validate prisoners and parolees, but they can validate members of the public, right? So what does that mean if you're an attorney and you're helping one of these people and you're associating with them and you write to them about anything related to any of the things I mentioned that they use to criminalize these people, they, they can use that to validate members of the public now. This is no longer happening in secret. This is not um, COINTELPRO. I mean, that, that still exists um, and uh, we, we've heard about Operation Prizac and, and these types of things, but now it's very much out in the open. They're saying, yes, this political stuff is gang-related terrorist material, and if we're not challenging that at its core, then what does that mean for us out here? What does that mean for the movement, for activists, for revolutionaries? Um, this, this goes to the core of what we're fighting for. Um, and if we're, not, if we're not supporting the people that are in prison, then what, what does that mean for what we're doing out here? And I would just like to follow up on the question of why people should get involved, especially why the Guild should get involved. And one succinct way of understanding solitary confinement for me is that it is, primary, it is a weapon of terror and it's used to keep the prisoner population in line. The prisoner population is used to keep poor communities in general and communities of color in particular in their place. The socioeconomic conditions in those communities are used to keep the middle classes in place, and they carry out the social, economic, and political agenda of the ruling class. That's, in a nutshell, the domestic power base from which the United States ruling class projects imperial force around the globe. It is an interconnected, nested system of violence and terror, and this is its innermost core. It is important that it's recognized and that the fight against solitary is integral to any human rights movement.
system is by, by you know, individual conversations across the dinner table. This is how we build our movement. So you have to look for words like CCR. Um, you have to look for the shoe. You have to look for the whole for isolation, segregation, administrative segregation, punitive segregation, disciplinary segregation. There's all sorts of different words in, um, in whatever state or area that you come from, also in, the, in our jail, jails, um, you solitary confinement as well. So please um, you know, get involved with the work that these folks are doing. Thank you so much. Your father will be coming home. We will all be working to make sure your father comes home. This is a, you know, I encourage you to, to advocate on the health behalf, on, on the, um, for the folks that are involved in the, the hunger strike. I know Robert King, who um, was one of the, is one of the three members of the Anvil, which continues this day to suffer from some health impacts from the hunger strike that he led in Angola, him and Herman and Albert, um, 30, 40 years ago. So this is how you begin to have your you know, um, connections with an individual and how we can continue to do this personal advocacy and this social justice um, in this context. So thank you. Uh, Marisa has told me that she has a message from her father that she would like to read in Spanish and that she wants Jan to come translate, as Jan seems to have anticipated. <laughs> no, um, my, well, it's not a message, it's a letter. <laughs> my dad is forbidden um, since February of 2013 of writing messages for the outside of the Finnish century if the warden doesn't approve the message. So it's not a message, it's a letter. <laughs> um, he knew I was gonna be here with you guys today and it's in Spanish. Um, so I'm gonna read it and I'm gonna have Jan help for translating. It's a small letter. Bienvenidos y bienvenidas a Puerto Rico. El hecho que Puerto Rico sea la colonia más vieja del mundo y nosotros seres colonizados, pero no por ello hemos dejado de ser un pueblo caribeño y latinoamericano. Los que amamos esta patria queremos verla libre y soberana, unida al resto de las naciones libres del mundo y luchando para que este mundo sea uno mejor y más justo. Por ser colonia experimentamos males nefastos y tóxicos, Después de tantos años de ser colonizados, la adoctrinación y la propaganda han afectado adversamente nuestra identidad, nuestro desarrollo, la calidad de vida y la seguridad de vivir en paz y armonía. Pero hemos defendido y mantenido fuerte nuestra cultura, nuestro idioma y nuestra identidad. Y a pesar que hay más puertorriqueños fuera de Puerto Rico que aquí, la diáspora boricua también ha luchado y sigue luchando aún cuando en la, es la etnia con el nivel de pobreza más alto y los más marginados entre todos los latinos. Nada de esto asegura un buen futuro para nuestro pueblo. Pero somos un pueblo que hemos luchado por más de dos siglos por nuestra independencia y la lucha ha continuado. Porque los y las boricuas que sembraron la semilla de la lucha por la independencia lo hicieron por amor y lo que se hace por amor perdura. Las generaciones que los sucedieron no tiraron la semilla y la lucha ha continuado. Y como ha perdurado, ello nos ilustra que algún día vamos a triunfar. Sabemos que Puerto Rico será una nación libre y soberana y que un mundo mejor es posible porque nos atrevemos a lucharlo y a resistir. En resistencia y lucha, Oscar López Rivera. Puerto Rico. The fact that Puerto Rico is a colon the oldest colony in the world and we are colonized, but we don't ever stop being a, a Caribbean and Latin American people. Um, those of us who love this homeland want to see it free and sovereign, united with the rest of the free nations of the world and struggling so that this world will be a better and more just place. Um, for being a colony, we experience the, the worst uh, that the U.S. has to offer. Uh, after so many years of being colonized, um, the doctrination and the propaganda have adversely affected our identity, our development, the quality of life, 
and um, our ability to live uh, safely in harmony and peace. But we have defended and maintained very strongly our culture, our, our language, and our identity. And in spite of the fact that there are more Puerto Ricans outside of Puerto Rico than on the island, the diaspora, uh, the Puerto Rican diaspora has also struggled and keeps struggling even when, even when, La etnia. Ah, when, when Puerto Ricans have the highest level of poverty and are the most marginalized among all Latinos. None of this bodes well for the future of our people. But we're a people who have struggled for more than two centuries for our independence, and w the struggle has continued. Because Puerto Rican men and women have sown the seeds of struggle for independence, um, and they've done it with love, um, what what that what means what that means is that love lasts. The generations that um, have succeeded that that seed that was sown, um, and the struggle continues. Um, and and given that it has lasted so long, it demonstrates to us that someday we will triumph. We know that Puerto Rico will be a, a free and sovereign nation, and I just lost the end. Oh. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, we were almost done. Basically, what, what he was saying was we know we'll win and that Puerto Rico will be a free and sovereign nation, and he always ends his letters in resistencia y lucha, in resistance and in struggle, Oscar Lopez Rivera. Uh, it's seven after five. I think this panel is supposed to wrap up around five, um, and I think ending on Oscar's words are appropriate. So before we leave, if everybody could just join me in thanking our panelists one more time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the list for Pelican Bay Advocacy is in the back of the room. Please sign up.